Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on release notes, issues, and best practices. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, how to create high quality release notes in ever increasingly complex environments. Uh, after the webinar is over, there will be a recording that will be able to be downloaded in several days, and you can ask questions along the way. And at the end of the webinar, I'll uh, go through them and we'll see what kind of things people are thinking about. So welcome. Uh, my name is Casey Jordan. I'm the co-founder of Jorsec LLC. We develop a content management system for structured content called EasyDita. It's an end-to-end -end solution for authoring, reviewing, publishing, translating uh, structured content. And I also I have a background in physics and software engineering, uh, which has kind of given me a unique perspective on the topic today of creating release notes. Uh, it is the kind of marriage between uh, software engineering in many cases, and uh, content engineering. So what I want to talk about today that we found really interesting is uh, two major challenges that we've discovered in developing release notes. Uh, the first is that uh, leveraging high quality and personalized release notes can be a great way to improve uh, your customer uh, satisfaction and confidence and attract new customers. But that can be a really big challenge if you don't have a good process built around it. And then secondly, we're going to take a look at what barriers companies often encounter in these complex environments, uh, things that might prevent us from leveraging release notes, and we're going to take a look at how to break those barriers down. So by complex environments, the types of things that we're talking about is companies that have multiple product lines, uh, multiple versions of those product lines, user types and audiences that might need to uh, have personalized release notes specifically for them. Uh, multilingual requirements uh, where you might be uh, distributing a product globally and you need to translate that content into a specific locale or language. And then also the requirement for multiple publishing media formats. So a lot of companies are required to uh, create hard copy formats like PDF and things like that of their release notes, but they also would like to deliver those release notes in other uh, media formats like HTML5 uh, for mobile viewing or even deliver them directly into the product. So an example of this might be a high-tech company that produces several product lines which all might share a similar software component. And for each one of those products, they might sell multiple versions such as basic or professional. And the sheer number of different product variations uh, means that having to deliver a lot of release notes which are similar and potentially interdependent can be a really huge challenge. So this can create some serious bottlenecks and affect the overall quality of the final deliverable because it's often rushed through. And so what we've kind of found is that for most companies, the status quo is effectively broken. Um, ideally, release notes can be a great way to increase customer satisfaction and confidence, as well as attract new customers. However, most companies treat them as more of an afterthought. Uh, we've heard before that people say it's just something that has to be done in order for the version to ship. And this leads to deliverables which might not be very informative and can often raise more questions uh, than they ultimately answer. So Worse than that is that uh, release notes often don't closely align with uh, their documentation. So readers that go through and use these release notes as essentially as cliff notes uh, to the upgrade or the new version don't have a good way of actually diving into the actual product documentation, which contains more information that they might uh, they might want to dig into for uh, to determining if they want to upgrade or something like that. And ultimately, uh, what this results in is a lot of missed opportunities, specifically missed opportunities around revenue and customer self-support. So it used to be the case that uh, really only technical people read the release notes, uh, but that really is rapidly changing over the last decade. Users have become a lot more savvy and hungry for information. And often users use release notes as a sneak peek uh, of what to expect from the product or version. They may use them to determine why they might want to upgrade in the first place or to see if a feature they requested or a bug they reported had gotten any attention given to it uh, during the last software cycle. And that's really important because they don't have to actually raise a support request to do this. And raising support requests is a frustrating experience for the user and it's also something that, uh, that is taxing on, on your business. 
So at our company, we have seen customers become a lot more vocal about wanting higher quality release notes. And we've also seen the public becoming more and more vocal about it at the same time, which is really interesting to see uh, that kind of rise in non-technical or even technical users uh, really demanding higher quality release notes just the same way that they've demanded higher quality documentation. So one of the things that we did is we kind of did a quick Twitter search um, to see what were people talking about related to release notes. So here's some of the good ones that we found, and I'll read them out loud for uh, anybody that just might be on audio only right now. So Manuel says, seriously, very few commercial products have this kind of high quality videos and release notes. The engagement team volunteers are awesome. This user says to Slack headquarters, please tell the person that writes your release notes that he or she is awesome, almost always something funny in those. Here's some more good ones. <clears throat> File comments now show up in real time, almost faster than you can type them, but not quite. So this is some examples of the uh, very witty copywriting in an unexpected place. Again, another one directed at uh, Slack HQ. Um, and this user is, is delighted by it. And then another one here that the release notes had fixed. The app now scrolls down when you begin writing your file comment, giving your precious fingertips much needed beauty rest. <clears throat> and then we get into uh, some of the bad ones that we found. So Tyler says, Facebook iOS app release notes are just atrocious. I suspect they don't tell us what has changed, so they get less flack from haters. And then I follow up to that one. I can't explain it, but it feels a bit like being cheated or lied to like they are hiding something from me. And not to pick on Facebook, but we have another one from Scott Cormier. Is it just me or the release notes for Facebook's iOS app simply a mixture of laziness and arrogance? And then a couple more of them that we found. Facebook, your release notes in the iPhone app are terrible and tell me nothing about what is new or why I should upgrade. And reading a thread about writing release notes make me realize that developers are terrible at effectively communicating with users. So <laughs> a user there uh, kind of lamenting the fact that probably the release notes that he was given uh, were not curated by a uh, talented technical writer and they were just written by a developer. So what this really comes down to is a reputation issue. And these users are talking about their satisfaction or dissatisfaction with companies' release notes. And it's something that they're doing uh, in a, a global area where everybody can see these. It's, it's something that they're uh, directing to their peers and coworkers and things like that. And this is so important because uh, reputation is gonna drive buying or retention decisions for clients. It's gonna affect whether people refer your product um, or how well they review it. And we really believe that release notes, the quality of release notes also directly reflects on uh, your company's culture. It's important uh, to do everything as well as you can and to provide your customers with the best possible experience. And so if you're spending a lot of effort in one area uh, with the customer experience and then uh, something like release notes kind of falls off on the other end and doesn't get any attention, uh, it's kind of a gap uh, in that mantra of your company's culture. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, and this is something that we found, is that buyers are really doing their homework these days, especially in enterprise software uh, or high-tech manufacturing, things like that. Um, they're, they're making big purchases. Um, they're talking with other people. They're determining what people think that already use the product. And if those people are technical in nature, uh, release notes are often something that's gonna be a black eye if they're not done well. So in order to, to fix these issues and then also uh, to kind of gain the benefits of having uh, this, having better customer retention and higher reputation and changing our culture, we really have to look at delivering higher quality release notes to fix all these different issues. And that kind of brings up the question is, you know, what really defines high quality release notes? And we've been thinking about this for a couple of years, and we think we put together a pretty good model. Uh, and that really all revolves around, you know, the more useful the release notes are to the end users, then that ultimately means the higher means higher quality. And we can break these levels of usefulness down into these four kind of uh, levels of maturity. Um, the first one being release notes that are curated. Uh, the second one, organized. 
integrated and personalized. And we're gonna go through each one of these one by one so we can see exactly what we're talking about. <clears throat> so the first level is the process of taking release notes, which are usually, uh, they usually stem from some type of project or issue management system and curating them so that we remove technical jargon, uh, make it easier for users to understand and hopefully give them something that ultimately delights them. And so a really simple example of curation uh, for just uh, copy editing essentially is, is taking something like this issue, reduce the, or <clears throat> taking something like this issue says, reduce the need for buffering in the video subsystem to improve performance when loading over high latency connections and making that something that really any user can understand. And so we might have it uh, curated to say something like significantly improved quality of video for users without broadband slash high bandwidth connections. That means that users are gonna actually get something uh, useful uh, out of this instead of just being bewildered by it. So curation is really the, the first step and it's really the most important step. So this is an example of part of our release notes. And uh, what we've done here is we've kind of taken this idea of curation one step further. We also curate our individual uh, notes in the document, but for each area of our UI, uh, we provide a curated section that kind of introduces to the user uh, what the interface might be, what the new addition might be and something like that, and talks to them like a person and does, just doesn't give them a big list. And this has been very successful. The next level or the next part of curation is uh, adding screenshots and examples. And so we've heard from a lot of different users that uh, they're getting requests from their customers to see before and after screenshots. And this has been a big push for our users as well. And it kind of logically makes sense. Um, reading something in the release notes that might relate to some type of user experience or UI, it's very difficult to the user to understand what exactly has changed. And so adding in these extra before and after uh, pictures can provide a really uh, good user experience for the user. So uh, here is a screenshot again from our release notes and uh, we have a bullet here that talks about an enhancement. We renamed the view assignment button to open in the inbox interface which now launch, launches the review interface and we show the before as well as the oh, as well as the after picture so that the users can see that view assignment is now gone and we have a view details and an open button. The next level is uh, organization of your release notes. Users like to see release note information presented in an easily digestible way. Typically, release notes are delivered as a long list though with not a lot of organization uh, and it doesn't have a lot of assistance to help the user find what they're most interested in. So what we found is that users, uh, first users are most interested in, in what new substantial features were added to the product. Uh, then after that, they want to know what minor improvements were made to existing features. These are kind of things like enhancements. Uh, then lastly, what bugs were fixed. Um, and then potentially you might have something related to other like a miscellaneous or operations. And so this gives the user a very easy way to go through and see the things that they're most interested in uh, in the release notes instead of having to scan down through different sections and long lists and things like that. For more complex release notes, we can also do things like add subcategories, and we'll show an example of how we've done that in a second, where you might break up this new enhanced fixed kind of paradigm based on uh, areas of the software. So in Easy Data, we have, uh, we have a user interface called the Content Manager. It's a content manager interface where people can search uh, and create files, browse. And so in our UI, we provide uh, release notes to each specific UI component. We have uh, a lot of users that work in different parts of the software and because our software is so large in scope, uh, not all users use every single feature. And so it's important for our users to be able to go in and say, okay, 90% of the time I spend my day using the content management interface or the authoring interface or the assignments interface. And so they can hone in exactly on what things that might change that might impact their day-to-day -day work. So here's a uh, screenshot from our release notes that's talking about the dashboard area of the software. And you can see that we've got our new enhanced and fixed broken out very easily there.
The next level is making sure that in release notes are integrated with the other relevant uh, systems and uh, content that's in your ecosystem. So ideally, release notes should be linked uh, to your online documentation for more context when possible. And like I said before, if a user sees something that they're interested in that's just a one-line bullet in an area about something that might have been fixed or added, uh, allowing them to jump out of that and go to the actual documentation to get more information on that is a great way to reuse content and it's also a great way to provide additional use, uh, improved user experience there where they can actually uh, determine if something uh, something impacts them. They might not be called out specifically in the release notes. We also should make our release notes available to potential buyers that are doing due diligence. So there's a couple ways to do that. It, PDF is kind of difficult because PDF doesn't show up in search results often uh, as, as, the, as we would like. So we really should be delivering uh, these assets on our website as uh, an HTML format that can be indexed and searched by Google and then also uh, available directly in the product. And so uh, one of the things that we've seen as a best practice is when the user uh, opens up the product, they should have a very clear way of browsing the release notes uh, and version information. And oftentimes that is shown to the user when they upgrade anyway. So integrating into the product is a great way to kind of kill two birds with one stone with that. And then the last part of integration is leveraging your release notes as a marketing asset. We've seen that documentation uh, has increasingly become more uh, legitimate as a source of information about a product. And so one of the things that we do, you can see this quote at the bottom, you know, our perspective, easy data customers read through our doc site and release notes before they buy our software. And we know this because we track it. We use uh, Google Analytics uh, and other analytics systems to see what users are spending time on on our site. And so we've seen over the years that there's been a big uptake in potential buyers and people looking at our software and evaluating us going through our documents documentation uh, and our release notes. And so we know that people are spending significant amount of time uh, looking at these and using that uh, as a source of information that affects their buying or upgrade decisions. And then the last level is uh, what we like to call personalization. So when you have all these different versions and product lines and variants and potential needs to uh, give uh, to, to create permissioning systems around these release notes, you might have some users that need to see some portions of release notes uh, and then other users that you don't want to disclose the entire set of to. Um, this creates a really uh, complex ecosystem in order to deliver uh, all these personalized uh, experiences. And so, you know, some, a simple example of that is uh, if you have two products, product A and B, and they share a piece of software between both of them. And so what sometimes people will end up doing is they, they want to uh, make sure that users of product A don't see issues that only relate to users of product B. And so this is a, a, ver a version of uh, personalization for the user and vice versa. We want to make sure that people that, that may not have permissions to see certain information don't end up seeing information that's not relevant to them. And then the second major uh, piece of personalization is special versions created for specific customers, uh, specific partners, or even for internal use. And so we have encountered a number of uh, people in the industry that are actually required by their customers to create specific versions of release notes for them that call out uh, things that that customer is interested in. And we see this especially in the enterprise where um, there might be a, a very tight relationship between a vendor uh, and a client, and they might be putting a lot of resources into a customized version of a product for them. These notes, they want something that calls out specific customizations for them or specific features that they're interested in. Another example of this is what we do internally, uh, which is that we tag content uh, for different user types. And this allows us to generate these custom versions uh, easily and automatically. So we can have one version of our release notes that basically discloses everything. And that might be uh, the release, the actual release note information for each kind of bullet in the release note with additional background information about the issue. So that might have a technical description, 
That might be uh, who opened the issue originally, uh, for what customer, who fixed it, and all this other information. And so this is stuff that's extremely useful for our internal um, support agents and our developers and our partners, but it's really not something that we wanna give out um, to all of our clients. So by tagging up the content in a very specific way, it allows us to then remove all that excess information when we produce a public facing version. And that's become uh, very valuable when we're doing quality assurance and uh, other things like that to have that internal use version on the back end. So now that we kind of have this release notes maturity model, um, the big question comes up is how do we accomplish this in ever increasing, increasingly complex environments? So like we were saying before, when we have many product variants and versions, multiple languages, uh, multiple audiences like internal support, external users, partners, developers, and then the need, the ever increasing need to do multi-channel distribution of the information to deliver both both in copies like PDF and Microsoft Word and things like that, but also deliver that directly inside the product uh, and as a web resource that's mobile ready and things like that. So one of the things that we uh, find pretty often is that uh, most companies are using a copy paste uh, workflow to accomplish this. So they don't do much in terms of uh, personalizing or uh, integrating um, or organizing the release notes. They take the simplest version they can possibly create uh, and they copy and paste it sometimes directly out of the issue management system into Microsoft Word documents or whatnot. And then when they need to create uh, customized versions for their clients, they'll copy and paste the information into another document uh, to show uh, just the relevant issues and things like that. And this is extremely time consuming, um, but it's better than the other option, which is that you provide one big set of release notes for all your versions. Uh, and we've seen this done before, and this becomes very, very confusing to the customer because not only do they have a very big document that they now have to wade through, um, they're constantly having to look at uh, other things that don't relate to the particular version of the product that they have. So some of the customers that we've interviewed have said that they have one to five people that are dedicated at least half time to creating some of these release notes for product launches. And as software teams become more agile and releases uh, are produced even faster, keeping up with this requires a lot more resources. So a lot of companies are not even uh, kind of taking the step to creating personalized release notes in that way because they're just still trying to keep up with the agile nature of software development. Uh, that being said, we have also spoken with companies that are in a situation where they have to create personalized release notes for each client. And like I said before, this really multiplies the problem greatly. Uh, and so we need to have some type of workflow and processes around this to make sure that companies can get to uh, this high level of maturity with the release notes, which is gonna result in customer satisfaction and retention and better reputation, uh, but without having to spend increasingly more and more resources. And so one of the things uh, that we tracked when we implemented this internally is just how much time we were spending before, what was the quality of our release notes and things like that. And we essentially went from a list style release notes that was just a bulleted list, uh, very plain and simple to something that we feel is a really great deliverable now uh, that has a lot of the best practices that you're hearing about today built into it. And during that process, by using things like automation, uh, we've cut our our total time to produce those by about 70%. Um, so that was a huge win for us. We got all this great maturity and high quality in our release notes, and we also removed a, a large amount of time we were spending on it. And so that really cam comes to the big problem that uh, we encountered when we were starting to do this. We knew that our customers were demanding higher quality release notes. We wanted to make sure we were delivering something as a content, uh, as a company that, that has a product for content development. We wanted to make, something, make sure that we were delivering something to our clients that, uh, that they would be proud of and that we would be proud of and things like that. Um, so it was especially important for us uh, in our particular industry to do this. And we started running into these bottlenecks. Um, and we started duplicating a lot of work at the same time.
So some of the things that we ran into uh, along the way that we were trying to solve with improved process was, like I mentioned before, um, firstly, issues were often manually copied directly out of our issue management system. Um, we use JIRA for issue management, and uh, we've they do have some export features, uh, but without a really tightly automated process, even with some of the export features, we were finding that we were uh, we were exporting to say Microsoft Word or Excel, and then we were doing a lot of copying and pasting uh, into Microsoft Word uh, or Google Docs or something like that. And with a curation process that was kind of largely based around Microsoft Word, we are also finding that a lot of these documents were being sent for review via email. And so anybody who's ever experienced kind of some of the nightmares that you can get when you start sending Microsoft Word documents around via email, um, we probably experienced uh, all of them. And so there was uh, styling issues where uh, one user would open a document in a different version and it would uh, it would mess up all the styling and then we would have to figure out what changes they made that were actually styling changes and what changes they made that were relevant to the actual copy in the document. Uh, we also had issues with people reviewing the actual styling of the document, something that we didn't want people to do because uh, we really wanted to automate that process entirely uh, later on. And then because uh, email was used, we get a lot of these copies that were being created uh, and they were being duplicated every time we sent an email and people sent an email back to us. And this meant that finding the authoritative version was often difficult and we had to merge all these changes back into uh, one single document at the end that we then used to uh, generate our different versions. Having all these special versions created for specific customers meant that we had a lot of duplicated content, which means that if we needed to curate uh, one issue that appeared in multiple versions of a release note, then we either had to curate that multiple times in every version, or we had to have some master version uh, that we did the curation once in and we copy and pasted it. And every version that needed to be produced kind of multiplied those problems. So in these kind of complex environments, and, and in our environment is kind of a a smaller version of what I think some of the larger enterprise companies um, see. We don't produce that many versions compared to some uh, some product lines, but we were seeing that it was taking exponentially more and more time to create these uh, more sophisticated and higher quality release notes. And so, you know, we're a structured content uh, company and we quickly realized that a lot of these issues uh, could be solved by using structured content. So one of the first things we did is we started writing our release notes uh, directly in DITA and we didn't use any of these other systems. Our documentation was already written in DITA and so it, it kind of, we were looking back on it and saying, you know, why didn't we start this process uh, in DITA right away? Um, but it seemed like release notes were such a simple document type that it really didn't require some of the great features that DITA had. Uh, but as we started creating more and more robust release notes, we found that there was a lot of things that we could that we could utilize. And so if you're not familiar with DITA, um, what it does is it allows you to break all of your uh, content, or in this case, release notes, up into small components called topics. And these topics might have different functions. You might have concepts, which is a type of topic that you use to explain what something is, um, or a task that explains a procedure, troubleshooting or something like that, um, or references that have uh, data sheets and other things like that embedded into them. And so one of the really nice things about this is that uh, these topics can exist in a centralized database and they can all get linked together with these things that are called maps, which are really just like a way of creating table of contents. And so we start managing this content more like data uh, instead of like styled content. And we get a lot of automation potential, we get a lot of content reuse, and we get a lot of workflow benefits around this and centralization of content benefits. And it really, for us, it changed everything. So this is kind of an example. Um, you can imagine that you might have a bunch of small topics that are broken up at different granularities. For us, we like to break them up for release notes at kind of the individual note level. So we have these chunks of information and, and then we assemble those into different publications later on. And so in this case, you might, you might have this red topic here that might be a specific release note and we can reuse those in two separate publications very, very easily within the system, which means that we eff effectively eliminate any duplicate content. And then the really nice benefit is that just because of the nature of DITA, we can then uh, publish these into a lot of different formats automatically. And so all of our styling is done through automation 
and we don't spend any more time kind of tweaking styling inside uh, desktop authoring tools, which is fantastic. Another really great example, um, or another really great thing that we got out of it is the ability to do conditionalization. And so I was talking earlier about how we generate two different versions of our release notes for different audiences, one internal and one external. And so here is an example of a, a user guide that I think is a, a much better e or a much easier way of seeing the difference between these two, where the content for both of these user guides have been generated from one single source, and we just have areas that have been uh, kind of excluded out depending on the audience. So on the left-hand side, we have something that's much more technical. It might be something that's an internal user guide or whatnot. It has a lot more information. Uh, and then on the right, you have something that's more like a quick start guide. The same exact thing can be applied to release notes. And so here's another example. We've got a technical guide on the left that has more information and a getting started guide. And some of the information is slightly changed or excluded. And so we can do the same thing with release notes. So when we start to look at release notes as these chunks of information, these building blocks as data topics, we get some uh, really, really nice benefits out of it. Um, the first one is that they can be reused across these different variants like I was talking about earlier. Uh, the other thing is that they can be tagged with different metadata so that we can kind of automatically build documents for uh, each product and user and audience and these different variations that we want to create. Uh, which means that we're not doing a whole lot of copy and paste between these different versions and we're also managing it from one kind of single uh, central repository and we can also translate this content uh, and store the translations for reuse so the more that we translate the information that's that's in our documents the um, the less we have to translate it in the future. It kind of reuses the translations we've had in the past. Uh, and then we can also, at least internally, because we're a software company, we also found that uh, there was a great benefit with aligning these uh, small chunks of information with our development timelines. Um, because we weren't dealing with monolithic documents <clears throat> uh, that were all kind of like a huge Microsoft Word document, we could move these different uh, pieces of the document uh, through workflows at different times. So for instance, um, if uh, there was a lot of work being done on the content management interface of our software early on uh, in the software development cycle, uh, our writers could start working on that right away. And even they could even start working on just small portions of the content management interface release notes and things like that as it was made ready and they could take screenshots and things like that and they could then uh, build these documents uh, very easily over time instead of uh, doing all that at the very very end of development and so instead of trying to cram uh, at the very end of our release cycle to create all these release notes we could start a lot earlier and that resulted in a lot of huge benefits the other thing that's great is that version control is very Simple. When you have a structured format, it's extremely easy to see what's changed and who changed it, which is difficult in formats like Microsoft Word, especially when you have a lot of versions flying around. And then, like we mentioned earlier, publishing to multiple formats and multiple channels is really just a push button operation. And so you don't have to have somebody that goes and takes your Word document or whatnot and then has to handcraft it into HTML or something like that. And what this really comes down to is that we get a enormous automation potential. So DITA is really straightforward uh, and it's a very robust open format. It allows you to do all the styling and, uh, and things that you'd wanna do. It just kind of does it in a slightly different way and it lets you focus on writing content and styling later. And the other thing that was really great about this is that because we have this uh, very easily understandable open format, we realized that a big part of our process could be totally automated. And that was the process of getting our information out of our issue management system. So one of the first things we did after we got our, our release notes into DITA is we started thinking, okay, how can we remove the first part of the process, which is, was largely manual, which was users uh, taking the information from our JIRA system and turning that from issues and stories and bugs into things that were more curated uh, and have more of a release note form. And so we created a system that allowed us to uh, push a button 
and get a copy of all of our issues from a, <clears throat> a certain release in JIRA and have it converted automatically to DITA. And that resulted in a pretty big time savings. I think we decided it was about 25% of the time that we were spending uh, on our release notes process was immediately removed uh, with just this push button system. It took us about, I think about a half a week uh, to actually create, which was great. Uh, and then the other thing with automation is that reorganizing your release notes is really, really simple. Uh, it's almost a push button process. If you wanna move around uh, different sections and things like that, you can do it across multiple versions and publications all at the same time. And that's something that we were, that we were also running into as well is that uh, as soon as we started to have multiple versions um, of release notes and we had past historical versions as well, if we need to make, make edits or reorganize those, uh, without having something like DITA, we were doing it over and over again for each version. And uh, now that we have that information in DITA, it's very simple to kind of make that change in one place and have it propagated everywhere. So it's a really big, significant time savings. <clears throat> so as kind of an overview of how this works in practice, uh, for our company at least. We have new release notes that are automatically generated from our issue management system, which, like I was saying earlier, which is JIRA. And <clears throat> each release note becomes uh, a topic or part of topics uh, that are in the system that can be curated by a technical writer. And those topics can be edited and have most of the same kind of features you would expect from uh, like a rich text authoring experience. It's very Microsoft Word-like, but we're creating structured content behind the scenes that are broken down into topics that are these building blocks instead of creating monolithic Word documents. And then all these topics are aggregated together into our final deliverable, which uh, again is done with an automated process because we can link everything together through our JIRA issues. And <clears throat> that is what allows us to share content between all the different versions that we need to create that means that updates to notes can be done in one place and they get changed everywhere across all of our different versions, which is a great, uh, great time savings. And one of the really neat things about this uh, process of generating release notes is that if we need to generate release notes, say, for multiple versions of the product, uh, like 16.1, 16.2, 16.3, uh, and we need to pull new issues that might have been worked on, uh, bug fixes and patches and things like that to previous versions, uh, into existing release notes that are from several releases ago. Uh, this system is intelligent enough not to write over things that have already been curated. So it'll only generate and link in new issues that were created. So when we have to create a new, uh, a new update for a past release or a branch or something like that, excuse me, um, we don't have to go through and recurate things that we've already curated, which is great. And then some of the other benefits that we get out of this is that because we have these granular building blocks that are topics, uh, we get collaboration benefits because people can work on different topics at different times. So we get workflow benefits because topics can move through workflows independently. It doesn't have to be the whole document. So I can have uh, one topic that has a, just a certain section in it that goes through and moves through a different workflow while the rest of the system or the rest of the topics in the system don't change because maybe they, they aren't ready or haven't been worked on yet. Um, and then we get organization and findability and search and all the stuff that you would really like to have because we can put these things into a content management system very easily. So that concludes kind of our conclusion of best practices. Uh, I'd like to take some time now to field questions about the process. So let me open up our questions here. Okay, so one of the questions we have now is, uh, you mentioned JIRA. Did you investigate exporting JIRA items to XML and converting them into DITA XML automating that process? So this was probably asked a little bit earlier in the presentation, uh, but yes, that's essentially exactly what we ended up doing. Um, we have a X query process that will pull uh, issues from JIRA and it will convert them into DITA. And one of the really interesting things that we did with that, uh, which makes JIRA work well with this process is that in JIRA, you can define a lot of custom metadata. And so uh, what we have our developers do is uh, tag every JIRA issue with the version 
that it's for, which you would expect to have. Uh, but we also tag it with things like the relevant customer, the relevant part of the software user experience. And so one of the things that allows us to do is it allows us to very easily surface uh, issues in the content that might be relevant for a particular customer if we need to, just by tagging up the content automatically. And <clears throat> It also lets us automatically organize the content based on the specific part of the software that it relates to. All right, do we have any more questions? I think that was the, that was the major question. Okay, I got a couple more coming in here. So I got a question from Suzanne. When publishing to HTML, do you use a static file or a dynamic file? So we right now we have a couple of ways that we publish uh, to HTML. Uh, we have a plugin that lets us publish this directly to our documentation site, which is uh, more dynamic. It include, it's a, a hosted solution. Um, it allows us to do search on the content and things like that and style it. Uh, and then we're also moving uh, to our, an internal portal that we developed that allows us to serve the data content directly as uh, HTML. So instead of us publishing to HTML, we're going to uh, use our another internal portal product that we have to basically sh um, dynamically convert the content from data to HTML in real time when the user sees it. And that gives us the benefit that we can uh, automatically curate and personalize the content based on information we know about the user. And so the users, <clears throat> every user in our system will have different metadata about what parts of the product that they use or what tier of the product they use. And so that gets fed into our rendering system and it allows us to uh, personalize that content dynamically. Another question by Rich is, are there tags in your JIRA issue that specif specify whether a release note is needed? Yes, this is something that we do. We have a field uh, that's called it include in release notes and it's a required field. And so uh, that makes it a lot easier in the automation process to make sure that we don't generate anything that really just needs to be internally facing. We still do generate those issues into our JIRA, but they're tagged as being internal only. So the customer doesn't actually see them when they get published. So question from Roger, um, do we edit any of the issues inside JIRA to kind of curate them inside the issue management system so that it converts better and works better downstream? Uh, this is a great question. So. When we were kind of looking at uh, how do we generate all these different versions and at what level do we actually do the curation? You know, do we do the curation inside JIRA because it is the ultimate original source of information. Um, but the issue is that doing doing authoring inside of JIRA is um, there's a lot to be desired. And we, our technical authors really wanted something that was gonna be robust enough to allow them to do whatever they wanted uh, for the final output. And so we ended up uh, deciding that it would be better to just let people curate the information once it gets into DITA, where they have all the tools that they need uh, to produce robust content, instead of kind of splitting the workflow between you know, partially in JIRA and partially uh, inside the DITA. And that's so far worked out great because it means that our technical writers don't have to deal with JIRA any more than they need to. Uh, and it also means that uh, there, isn't too, there isn't too much stuff going on inside the JIRA that developers need to pay attention to uh, in terms of other, uh, other fields flying around or things changing with their issue names and stuff like that. So another question, uh, can users sort on items to get a dynamic list? So I'm assuming that uh, what you're asking is that they might be able to uh, dynamically reorder how the release notes are presented. And this is something that we don't have uh, in our system currently, but it's something that we're really interested in because we understand that some high value features that could be added to this system right away are things like, uh, 
automatically reorganizing based on a uh, user's preference uh, or their personal choices, and even better, the ability to uh, have a search filter at the top of the release notes that would not necessarily do a search, uh, but would simply filter out content as they typed. Um, and the more specific their query got, the uh, smaller and smaller the sections of the release notes would be so that they could just hone in on certain things that they were looking for. And once you get that content into a format like DITA, doing something like that is really easy to do. So another question that we have is, how are you getting information about the customer? Um, so this is a great question as well. And he mentions a Salesforce integration. And so uh, that's exactly exactly correct. We uh, we have our instances, our software instances that push information um, to our Salesforce. And our Salesforce then tracks metrics and different things uh, about the different customers. And that allows us to deliver a more personalized experience to each customer. All right, so I'm gonna wait a little bit longer to see if any other questions pop up. All right, looks like we've, oh, got another one here. They've got a question from Steve. Any thoughts on providing contextual release notes so that users can see the changes in your software based on the feature they're currently using? Yeah, so this is a, another great benefit that we would like to work on. Um, I imagine that a feature that would be extremely useful to users is uh, something that kind of worked like a faceted search, but for your release notes, where a user could have checkboxes for the different uh, features that they use, uh, different operating systems, things like that. And if you didn't have information about the user right away that was based on some metadata that you collected or stored about them, then the user could use that uh, interface to go through and check the boxes that says, okay, you know, I'm using this version of the software on uh, Windows platform uh, and I'm interested in this interface and this interface, yada, yada, yada. And you could tailor down <clears throat> what was shown to the user based on those attributes. And that would be something, again, that would be very easy to do because we have this structured content format. Great question. All right. So thank you guys very much for joining us today and uh, for asking some really great questions. Uh, anything else that you might uh, think about and you want to talk to us about, you can contact us. Uh, go to easydita.com. We'd love to hear uh, more questions you have or even just sit down and uh, talk through some of the issues you might be experiencing with release notes. We're in a phase right now where we're collecting a lot of information about how people work release, with release notes and how we can take some of the things that we've done internally and help other customers uh, do the same thing. Also, we're going to have a follow-up webinar May 16th, and this is going to go through the technical considerations, kind of a how-to uh, for this implementation. It's going to talk a lot more about how we automatically generate these release notes from our issue and project management system, show you some of the custom metadata that we've uh, added to our JIRA system that might be relevant for users that are using similar project management systems that can help in automation. Uh, we're going to talk about how we actually reuse content across these multiple deliverables, how we use uh, conditionalization to generate those release notes that are internal uh, and also uh, can be used for, can be published without the internal information for our public facing audiences. We'll talk a little bit about how we automate styling and publishing, and then also the benefits of having all of this centralized in a system where we can uh, do review and approval in a, a maximally efficient way, instead of sending uh, PDFs or Word documents around via email and things like that and having them reviewed that way. So I hope that everybody joins us for that. And uh, thank you very much. Have a great day.